Hello and welcome to Live Notes, an introduction to Imperial College's lunchtime concert series run by the Blythe Centre for Music and Visual Arts. My name is Bill Carslake, I'm a composer, writer and music director and I direct Imperial College's Sinfonietta. I'm delighted to introduce this recital given by the Imperial players with the pianist Daniel King-Smith. First item in our recital is played by An Sun Poon, who plays the first movement of Brahms's Violin Sonata in G major, Opus 78. This was written when Brahms was 45, and he had adopted the same approach as he used for his quartets, which is to say he'd actually written a few violin sonatas and destroyed them before he was prepared for this one to go into the public domain as his number one. It was written in the same period in which he wrote the Second Symphony and the Violin Concerto, and with them it shares a serenity and spaciousness. Listen out for that moment halfway through this movement when the pianist plays the main theme and the violin soloist accompanies playing simple pizzicato chords. Also listen for Brahms's development of a rhythmic trick which he borrowed from his great musical idol Beethoven, which is the use of groups of three which are offset against a main rhythmic pattern of twos and fours. So while the main rhythmic texture is four square, the soloist and the pianist cascade these threes which create space and light and propulsion. In terms of space, listen also to the first tune in the sonata and notice its silences, which are small and yet really significant. At this time, Brahms starts to develop this. So when you listen to the beginning of the third symphony, the silences are more pronounced. Later in his life, he produced melodies where the silences were much longer and there is a sense of what isn't there being as important as what is. When he sent this manuscript of the piece to Clara Schumann, his great friend, the internationally renowned pianist and composer, she played it through at the piano and then she wrote him a letter in which she said that having finished it, she burst into tears of joy. After this, we have Michael Cohn playing Mozart's Rondo in E-flat for French horn and orchestra, an orchestra of strings, two oboes, two horns, plus the soloist. This piece may have been intended as the last movement of a complete horn concerto, although we'll never know, and Mozart did then later write four complete horn concertos. As it is, it stands on its own, and it is a vigorous and joyous work, full of rising arpeggios, not a cloud in the sky, until at the very end there is an interrupted cadence, which is where the chord that we expect is replaced by a different chord. And in that moment, there is a sense of questioning or doubt, and yet that just serves to make the coda, which is the very final section, all the more mischievous and fun. Michael follows that by playing the Reverie in D-flat major by the Russian composer Glazunov. It's a shortish piece that is powerful, passionate, and feels like it's from the heart. And you may notice a similarity to his compatriot Rachmaninoff, who was eight years his junior. You may also know the story of how he made really quite a negative impact on the beginning of Rachmaninoff's career when uh, Glazunov conducted the premiere of Rachmaninoff's first symphony while drunk with disastrous consequences. Uh, it took Rachmaninoff four years before he was able to write anything again. Glazunov was, however, a child prodigy, a multi-instrumentalist uh, who taught pupils, including Shostakovich. Shostakovich told a story years later to the writer Volkov of a tour that Glazunov took in the UK conducting his own works and a rehearsal in which a British horn player stood up and said, this note is unplayable. Glazunov 
left the podium, walked through the orchestra, took the horn from the player's hands, and in Shostakovich's words, took aim, and then produced the note perfectly. Alex Usher follows this by playing the clarinet sonata by Saint-Saëns. This was written in 1921 when Saint-Saëns was 85 and in fact it's his penultimate work. His last work is the bassoon sonata. It is a powerful and measured work which has a flavour of the 19th century. It is quite extraordinary to hear something sounding as it does, knowing that it was written in 1921. Saint-Saëns would have been very much at home in Imperial, uh, as well as being a composer. He was very interested in maths and astronomy and geology. Alex follows this with the last movement from Alec Templeton's A Pocket-Sized Sonata for Clarinet, and the last movement is called In Rhythm. Alec Templeton was a highly talented pianist and composer, born in Wales, born blind, and he became the pianist for Jack Hilton's jazz band. And Jack Hilton was known as the British King of Jazz. And in 1936, Alec went with Jack and the band to New York, to America, uh, yes, New York, and stayed there for the rest of his life, dying at the age of 56. While he was there, Templeton wrote a string of hits, uh, one of which is, is titled Mendelssohn Mows em Down, which I recommend listening to. After this, we hear our final number in the recital, which is played. Finally, Bradley Ng plays Liszt's Tarantella in a performance that was recorded live in the Wigmore Hall. The Tarantella was published in 1861 as part of a collection of pieces called Venezia e Napoli. But in fact, the Tarantella itself had been written some years earlier by Liszt to accompany one of his suites of solo piano pieces called Anne de Pellerinage. Now those pieces charted the pilgrimage years in which he and his partner, Comtesse Marie Dagou, travelled across Europe with young babies in tow. She, the writer and historian who wrote under the name of Daniel Stern, he, the rock star piano soloist who modelled himself on Paganini, in this piece, the Tarantella, he is adapting melodies that had already been written by the Neapolitan publisher, Guillaume-Louis Cotrau. And there's a particularly Neapolitan section in the middle that you'll hear, which Liszt calls the Canzona Napolitana. And he may be referencing that very popular Neapolitan instrument, the mandolin, when you'll hear him create this incredible decorative filigree passage work in the top of the piano and also repeated notes. In fact, listen for repeated notes throughout this piece. Repeated notes are hard on the piano and Liszt was a phenomenally successful piano soloist with a big following and he commanded huge fees and he liked to make sure that his technique could shine in his recitals. The Tarantella is a dance that is probably named after Taranto, which is in the heel of Italy, and was very popular in Naples. It achieved a certain notoriety at around this time for the fact that while being extremely fast, it could, they said, take the dancer close to a state of ecstasy. It's a dance which is in two groups of three, uh, in musical terms, that's six, eight, and it has this fierce perpetual motion. Being close to a state of ecstasy seems appropriate because it was that state which some audiences were said to experience at Liszt's piano recitals.
I hope you enjoy the performance. Do tune in for the other lunchtime concerts as part of this series run by the Blythe Centre. Many thanks.
Thank you so much for joining us. Unfortunately, uh, Bradley Ng has had to go into self-isolation, so he won't be able to play for us this afternoon. But I'm really pleased to say that he's been able to provide us with a uh, video of him playing Liszt's Tarantella, recorded live from, of all places, the Wigmore Hall. So I do hope you enjoy that. Thank you. 